This is number 10 in a series of 12 lectures on the doctrine of the Bible, and we're discussing at this time the important historical translations of the Bible, and especially that period uh, in English, particularly from the 7th century on down to the 20th century, and various translations and translators. And certainly no discussion along this line would be complete without the name of um, the next man we're going to examine, John Wycliffe who lived, ministered 1320 A.D. to 1384. And Wycliffe has often been called the morning star of the Reformation. An important thing to remember about Wycliffe is that he was the first man to completely translate the entire Bible into the English language. In fact, his was the only English Bible for approximately 145 years. So Wycliffe becomes a very important man in this discussion. And another man now, equally important, is William Tyndale. And uh, I've suggested rather facetiously in my notes that if Wycliffe was known as the morning star of the Reformation, uh, then Tyndale could rightly be called the Milky Way of the modern Bible, because no other single man in history, of course, did so much as tran for translating the Word of God for the people of God as did William Tyndale. And Tyndale worked in constant danger, but prior to his martyrdom, it is estimated that some 50,000 copies of the New Testament were circulated by this fearless and faithful servant of God. A few years ago, we had the opportunity, my wife and I and son and others, uh, from the Liberty Baptist College and Thomas Road Bible Institute, had the privilege of visiting London, and uh, we visited Bristol, England, and there a certain seminary there. And uh, to my delight, I was allowed to hold by the rector of the school a copy, one of the few, I believe, the only surviving copy of these 50,000 copies of the Tyndale translation of the Bible. I think the date was estimated around 1525, and I held that priceless copy insured for some $1 million in my hand and had the opportunity uh, to read John chapter 3 from the Tyndale translation of the Bible. And I want to tell you it was one of the great moments in my life uh, in doing that. All right, so there's Wycliffe, and then there's Tyndale, and then the uh, important translation of the Bible uh, we're going to study now, not just the names, but the translation itself, the Coverdale version, and that was put out in 1, uh, 1535 A.D., and the reason that the Coverdale is rather important is because this was the first whole Bible to be printed in English. Of course, before that, Gutenberg had invented the portable uh, printing press, and now the Coverdale Bible is the first Bible to be printed in English. Of course, now we've already said that uh, Wycliffe was the first man to, to write in the English language, write the Bible, but now Coverdale prints it. The Coverdale uh, Bible was printed in English for the first time. Okay, um, the Geneva Version, I'm skipping over some of these, but uh, others you may read about here. The Geneva Bible was very important, put out in 1557 B.C., and the reason so, because this was the first version to divide the text into verses. There are some 31,173 verses in modern Bibles, if you have a King James Bible. And of course, the Geneva Version was... Uh, translated before the King James, but it was the first to put the text into verses. And it was also the first Bible in Europe to omit the Apocrypha. And this Bible, the Geneva Version, was kissed by Queen Elizabeth, daughter of Henry VIII, at her coronation, a policy which is still followed by English kings and queens. It is said that uh, at her coronation, it was totally unrehearsed and unexpected, but she uh, just uh, grabbed the Bible or took the Bible from uh, one of the uh, ministers uh, near her side and, uh, to the astonishment of all, kissed it. And what she had in mind, I, I'm not sure anybody knows by doing that, but that's a policy that is still followed, and I think it's a pretty good policy. 
Now, the Geneva Bible was the most loved Bible by the common people up to that time, and it went through more than 160 editions. And it was the Geneva Bible that Shakespeare quotes from, and if you've ever read any Shakespearean plays, you know that that uh, he has a lot of Bible in his plays. He takes it from the Geneva Bible and also uh, the Bible um, used by John Bunyan when he was in prison because of his faith and he wrote that immortal Pilgrim's Progress. He quoted from the Geneva Version. And this Geneva Bible was the translation that the Pilgrims brought with them on the Mayflower in 1620 to America. Many Christians are a little surprised to hear this, and they think that, uh, you know, the, uh, it should, uh, that really was a mistake. Probably it was the King James. But the King James was not translated until really 1611, and it didn't become accepted until 20, 30 years later. And so uh, they arrived in 1620. It was Geneva, the Geneva Bible, actually, that the pilgrims brought with them to America. All right, now that we're um, referring to the King James, let's get right into this. Uh, without a doubt, the most famous, the most beloved, and certainly the most widely used translation of all time is the King James Version. All other versions put together, I do not feel could uh, equal or surpass the uh, the uh, fame that has surrounded the King James translation of the Bible. This was instigated at the recommendation and order of King James I. Apparently, King James never read the King James Bible, and uh, there's very little evidence from examining his life that will ever see him in heaven. But he did allow for the translation of this beloved version called the King James Version of the Bible. And it began on July the 22nd, 1604, and about seven or eight years later, in 1611, it was completed. The King James Version is remarkable, I think, for many reasons. It was, first of all, undoubtedly the most beautiful, the most beloved, and the most popular translation of all time. And as you have in your notes on page 78, uh, the king originally announced 54 men to be translators, and of these, 47 actually did the work. We don't know whether the other seven died or whether they dropped out before the translation really was completed, but 47 brilliant Greek and Hebrew and theological scholars. And at no other time in history did so many learned men gather together for one common purpose. Uh, Tyndale had a good translation of the Bible, and and the Geneva Bible is a good translation, and there are other Bibles that we could uh, call our attention to, but uh, certainly this one had more prayer and more godly scholarship in back of it than any other. In fact, we could again make the statement probably than all other translations before or after it put together. And uh, we have in our notes on page 79, it was probably also the only translation in which no parties involved had an axe to grind. Now, the Geneva Bible, uh, they had an axe to grind. They wanted to downplay the sovereign right of the king to rule. And a lot of the footnotes, uh, that uh, brings this out. So they had an axe to grind. And then you have other translations like the, uh, the Great Bible and the Bishop's Bible. We didn't discuss these, but these are translations that had an axe to grind. They were attempting to prove the right to rule by kings and bishops. And so various translators had various axes to grind, but not this one. It seemed to be really uh, just a group of men getting together and, uh, and coming up with a translation that the entire English world, actually Western civilization at that time, could rally around. And certainly God allowed them uh, to do that. Now... Uh, the King James did have uh, their, did have its uh, enemies and opposition. The Roman Catholics, uh, they frowned upon it because they said it favored Protestantism. Some of the Armenians said it leaned toward Calvinism. And even some of the Puritans that would later champion its cause, they disliked first certain words like bishop and ordained and the word Easter as used in the book of Acts. 
But after about 40 years, around 1650, it was put out in 1611, but by 1650 it overtook the popular Geneva Bible and has retained its tremendous lead ever since. I believe, I read statistics somewhere, that over one and a half billion copies of the King James has the entire Bible, let alone how many, uh, you know, editions or how many uh, copies just of the New Testament or the Gospel of John, but over one and a half billion copies of the King James Version of the Bible has been uh, printed and circulated to uh, half the known world, the languages of the world. All right, now, um, three more translations. Uh, let me just say about the King James. Uh, we uh, are often asked, what Bible do you use here at the Liberty Baptist College and Liberty Baptist School system? Well, uh, our favorite, uh, beyond uh, any question, of course, is the King James. I think there are two extremes, however, to as one approaches the King James Version of the Bible, and sometimes uh, this issue raises, I think, more heat than it does light, more thunder than lightning, as it were. And one extreme view is the King James is archaic and it's uh, out of date, it's uh, outmoded, and, and because of the these and the thous, and, and we need to turn to new and popular and relevant translations of the Bible. Well, of course, uh, that's such a stupid argument that I don't even take the time and the breath and the energy to refute it. Uh, the Bible, the King James Bible, is relevant, and the churches that uh, seem to be growing the fastest are using the King James, and we, we love it here, and we recommend it highly to our students. That's one view, though, that the uh, uh, you know uh, we should uh, set it aside. It was good for the Shakespearean day in Queen Victoria, but it's not good for ours. So the other extreme, though, is that the King James is the only translation that God ever blessed. And some folks would have us believe that we need to take every other translation of the Bible and burn it up, and that until 1611 we had no accurate translation of the Bible, and then after 1611 it's the only translation of the Bible that God has ever blessed. Now, of course, that simply is not true. There are very poor, very uh, shaky translations of the Bible, to be sure, and we'll name one in a minute. But uh, to say that statement is to run counter to all the facts of history. The truth of the matter is that God has on occasion blessed other translations. Uh, here are missionaries that uh, leave the English-speaking world and go out and have to translate their own Bible uh, from the Greek and Hebrew into various languages. And, and sometimes I ask people who say, well, if you don't uh, feel that the King James is inspired and all other versions should be burned, then we won't even support your school. Well, of course, that's their right. But I always ask that question, uh, where was the true Bible before 1611? And uh, then after 1611, the various missionaries that went out and translated the Word of God in other languages, were they translating the Word of God simply? Should they, should missionaries teach people to speak English in foreign countries, the pagans, the Laplanders, and the Tibetans, and the Eskimos, so they can read the these and thous of the King James? Well, these are the two extremes, I think. But again, to... Get back to the question, what do we think about the King James? We think it is head and shoulders above all other translations ever attempted and ever to be attempted. All right, now, in 1881 and 1885 and also in 1901, the uh, translation that has now been known as the New American Translation of the Bible uh, came out. And uh, it's a rather popular translation today. But as we have on page 81 in your notes, to the disappointment of its friends, uh, this version, especially the English version of 1881 and 1885, uh, its popularity was great for a while, but it immediately cooled off because people realized how much they would miss the old uh, King James, uh, you know, Shakespearean type approach to the Word of God. So it still remains the champion. I think I read some statistics also that even today with all your modern Bible translations that the King James still outsells all other translations about three to one, I think. So I don't think uh, you're listing my 
these tapes here and you love the King James as I do, I don't think we need to sit up and worry tonight uh, about the King James Version disappearing from the face of the earth. It's simply not going to do that. Now, the uh, next to the last one I'll discuss for just for a minute is the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. This was put out by the National Council of Churches, uh, both Old and New Testament, and uh, probably is the most controversial. Well, uh, there's another one now that's more controversial that I don't have in my notes. I'll discuss in a minute. But up to that time, certainly the most controversial uh, Bible probably in the last 100, 200 years maybe. Uh, Hebrew scholar Merle Unger uh, summarizes the Revised Standard, and I think he does an excellent job in summarizing in one statement here he says although this version has many excellencies in the new testament there are excellent passages uh, it translates yet it is weak and obscure in its translation of certain key old testament messianic passages and of course the, the glaring fault of the uh, revised standard version is isaiah 4, uh, 7 14 where it speaks of a young woman instead of a young virgin shall conceive and bear forth a son now the final one we, we're asked this almost as much as we're asked down here at Thomas Road about the King James. And what is our position on the living Bible? Um, I might say, uh, sometimes I ask, what, is, what do you feel about the living Bible version or the translation of the living Bible version? Well, there is no living Bible version. By that, I mean the living Bible is not a translation of the Bible and in a sense should not even be considered under the our chapter here the important historical translations of the Bible but it has erroneously been concluded that it is a translation of the Bible and therefore we need to take a minute to discuss it apparently what mr. Ken Taylor who is a friend of mine had in mind a number of years ago is when he translated uh, or when he paraphrased the the Bible uh, he wanted to do it to put in words for his children and uh, that's that's fine and I think adults can can be helped by this paraphrase but let me make this statement that I have a boy and he's almost 14 years of age now and when he really began to uh, understand uh, what mommy and daddy was saying we uh, went to a bookstore and we purchased a copy of the Moody Bible uh, storybook Moody Bible press storybook of the Bible and it was written by uh, uh, Christians who put the language of the Bible into children's language and so my wife and I took turns reading to Matthew un 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 from uh, the Moody Bible storybook of the Bible and uh, that was very helpful but then when it got time for us to get him a copy of the scriptures uh, we went to the store and bought him a King James Version and put his name on it and that was the Bible that Matthew carried to church we uh, we would not have allowed him to carry a Moody Bible storybook to church, even though we thought that was fine to learn the Bible, yet it was not a copy of the Bible. Now, I think, and now people misunderstand this, but you listen carefully, uh, I think that the living Bible paraphrase can be helpful if it's looked upon as a paraphrase, sort of a, a, sort of in a children's uh, a storybook of the Bible. It could be an adult paraphrase story book about the Bible but it is not a copy of the Word of God and even though I have a copy and I do use it uh, in order to help me uh, summarize sometimes in my sermons what I want to say yet uh, it uh, frankly it grieves me to no end to see Christians even in fundamental churches carrying copies of the living Bible paraphrase within the church now it is not a translation of the Bible uh, and a person can be saved by reading it in, in as much as they could be saved by reading one of D.L. Moody's sermons. And as fine as D.L. Moody's sermons are, they are not the Bible. They are about the Bible, but they're not the Bible. And we need to keep this in mind that, in fact, again, uh, I'll get some letters on this now, but I had rather see a Christian carry the Revised Standard Version, and believe me, we do not recommend that here. Let me repeat that. I do not recommend the Revised Standard Version. But if you're going to have to carry one of the two, which you shouldn't, uh, to church, I'd rather carry, see somebody carry the Revised Standard Version than the Living Bible, because at least the Revised Standard Version is a translation of the Bible. Now, it may be a poor one, but it's a translation. Well, I hope I've confused you sufficiently enough here, but that's our opinion on the Living Bible 
paraphrase. And uh, with this, we'll end this uh, note now on the or this chapter on the important historical translations of the Bible. Let me. Uh, I think this is by way of footnote here. I came across this little article, Bible facts to make you chuckle and learn. And uh, you might, uh, it's in Christian Life magazine, uh, printed some time ago, and uh, you just might like to take a few minutes here and, and uh, read something here about the various problems in translating the Bible and some of the funny things that happened. Um, let me see here. Beginning in the 16th century, a proliferation of Bible translations has taken place. Some of these confuse the people of that day as well as we are confused by the many translations today. All right, and then a number of Bibles came out at that time, and they began, became known by certain nicknames like the Breaches Bible, the Bug Bible, the Wife Beater Bible, the Unrighteous Bible, the Basketful of Errors Bible, the Vinegar Bible, the Murders Bible. Now, the only difference is that many of these strange-sounding translations were created by printers' errors instead of the translators' whims, and so some of these printers made mistakes and uh, they became known as this. For example, the most famous of these unusual editions, according to the National Geographic Society of the Bible, is called the Breaches Bible. This is an English language Bible printed in 1560 in Switzerland, and it derives its name from the third chapter of Genesis, where the translators had Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together to make breeches and not the familiar aprons of the King James Version. So it's called the Breaches Bible. And then in 1551, uh, there was a Bible uh, translated uh, that uh, the heir put, uh, or I mean the, the, the translator, when he came to Psalm 91, he speaks of the bugs, B-U-G-G-E-S, by night instead of terror by night. Remember it says, uh, thou shalt not be afraid of the uh, arrow by day or the terror by night. And uh, so uh, uh, he put down the bugs. And uh, in fact, Tyndale used this translation, I think, uh, and the bugs became boogie. And uh, do you ever wonder, you know, we teach our children or sometimes uh, children say, well, I'm afraid of the boogeyman. Well, there's a translation here, this 1551 Bible, thou shall not be afraid of the boogeyman by night. So that was called the bugs or the boogie, boogie Bible. All right. Uh, and then there's the wife beater Bible. Uh, the Apostle Peter, of course, advised the husband to treat his wife as the weaker vessel in one of his epistles. Uh, but the translation of a 1549 English Bible added this stern footnote, quote, And if she be not obedient and helpful unto him, uh, he should endeavor to beat the fear of God into her head. <laughs> so lady, some chauvinistic uh, translator put that in. Well, um, there's also uh, a Bible called the Unrighteous Bible, and uh, because they inadvertently left out a line in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But they mistakenly left that out, and it came out reading this way, the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God. So uh, this edition survives even today with the title of the unrighteous Bible. Uh, the Wicked Bible it was published in 1631. It received its nickname from the omission of the word not, N-O-T, from the seventh commandment. So instead of reading, thou shalt not commit adultery, it read, thou shalt commit adultery. Now here again, the printers certainly had no intention of doing this, but they were sloppy and, and printed them real fast, and so that was known as the Wicked Bible. And then uh, there's the Fool Bible, because in Psalm 14, uh, they left out uh, something also, and it came out this way, the fool has said in his heart that there is a God, instead of that there is no God, and that became known as the Fool Bible. Um, and then there's the Murderer's Bible, because uh, there's a phrase in Mark 7:27 that says, Let the children first be filled, and then such and such take place. That's what Jesus said. But uh, they changed the F to a K, and it actually came out this way, Let the children first be killed. And so uh, this is called a murder's Bible. And as a concluding note here, the fearsome Puritan religious divine, Cotton Matter, thundered out against the scandalous error of printers. And he used a text, Psalm 119, which had an appropriate misprint, because instead of reading, Princes have persecuted me without cause, this said, Printers have persecuted me without cause. And so these are some Bible facts to make you, as I say, the author, author says, chuckle and to, to learn. All right, now the final 
section, part 8 in our textbook, proofs that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. How do we know that our faith is the right one? And on page, beginning on page 83, we have this little uh, summary here of uh, or this little uh, imagine, imaginary situation where you're asked to defend your faith in the presence of a Buddhist and a Moslem and a Shintoist and a Confucius and the rest. How do you know you're right and why should you become as I am? What would you say? Well, if you have this opportunity to defend your faith, uh, we suggest three things you couldn't say. You couldn't say, all right, as a Buddhist, uh, I know that you're sincere, but you ought to become a Christian. I know I have the right faith because I feel I'm right. Christ lives in my heart. And a lot of times Christians answer that way. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Well, there's no doubt about that. But you see, the Buddhist might say, uh, Buddha lives in my heart. You see, uh, I know Christ lives in my heart, but it's rather difficult for me to convey that simply by making the statement uh, to somebody else. So you couldn't just appeal to how I feel, see. And secondly, you couldn't say, I know I'm right because Christianity has more followers in this world than any other religion. Now, you take Bible-believing evangelicals and fundamentalists really uh, we have a lot of influence in America, but as far as the four billion people in this world, we are in a distinct minority, so you couldn't say that. And besides that, if we were in a majority, it might mean we're wrong, because often the majority is wrong. In fact, the Bible says, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and narrow, and, and uh, uh, many find that, uh, and narrow and straight is the way that leads to salvation. So you certainly couldn't appeal uh, to... Uh, you know, a large segment of mankind believing what you do. And thirdly, you could not say, I'm, I know I'm right because Christianity is the oldest of all religions. Well, it certainly is. Uh, but uh, the Buddhists might point out and the Confucius might point out that long before Christ, at least was born in Bethlehem, and long before Pentecost, there were uh, Buddha and Confucius and some of the other religions. So actually, you'd have only one weapon, but that's enough. And you could say that you could hold up your copy of the Bible and say, I know I'm right because the author of my faith has given me a book which is completely unlike any of the books of your faiths. And you could say that without any mental reservation whatsoever, without any fear of successful contradiction. The greatest thing about the Christian faith, of course, is the Bible. Now, the greatest person in the Christian faith is Jesus. That's the living word. But the greatest thing about the Christian faith is the written word, the Bible. So, there are at least ten evidences that this book is indeed the Word of God, written by God Himself. And we're going to study these because of the unity of the Bible, the indestructibility of the Bible, the historical accuracy of the Bible, the scientific accuracy of the Scriptures, the prophetical accuracy of the Bible, the universal influence, the care and copy, the amazing circulation of the Bible, the absolute honesty, and finally, the most important of these ten, I believe, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, the life-transforming power of the Bible. Years ago, John Wesley once stated the case for the divine inspiration of the Bible in this way. He says, I beg leave to propose a short, clear, and strong argument of the Holy Scriptures. Now, here's his argument proving that the Bible is the Word of God. And it's a very simple one, but it is a very profound one. Here's what he says. The Bible must be the invention of either good men, bad men, the devil, or God. So he said it has to come from one of these sources, good men or bad men, the devil or the Lord. I mean, it's here. Now, how did it come into being? Did angels write it? Did demons write it? Okay, now, he says it could not be the invention of good men or of angels, for they neither would, for they neither would nor could make a book and tell lies all the time they were writing it, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when it was their own invention. So the Bible could not have been written by honest men, by good men, I mean apart from God. It could not have been written by 
angels because angels and good honest men, suppose there is no God, it's just a fake now, they could not have lied in the Bible and still be good men, see, because they would have been lying by saying that this actually was written by God when they themselves wrote it. So it could not have been the invention of good men or, or angels. Now, secondly, it could not have been the invention of bad men or demons, for they would not make a book which commands all duty, forbids all sin, and condemns their souls to hell for all eternity. So it couldn't be, humanly speaking, just the work of good men, because they wouldn't have claimed it came from God. They'd be liars, and good men don't lie. It could not have been the invention of bad men or demons, for they wouldn't have written the good things that are in the Bible. Therefore, Wesley says, I draw the conclusion that the Bible must be given by divine inspiration. Now, state the argument another way, and we've said this several times, man could not have written the Bible if he would, and man would not have written the Bible if he could. All right, now, what about the proofs that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, of course, there is first the supernatural element, the amazing unity of the Bible. And by the way, it is good to know these arguments because when we do them, I think we actually uh, fulfill the command given by Simon Peter in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 15, when he says, Sanctify, that means to set apart, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's, that is in you. So, child of God ought to know not only the scriptures themselves, and that's more important, of course, than anything else, but he ought to know why he believes what he believes. All right, the amazing unity in the Bible. And we suggest here that you sometime draw a, a big circle like you're going to put a clock. And uh, number one, where the uh, uh, letter one would go, you put the book of Genesis and then go right on down. Number two, Exodus. Of course, you'll have a lot more than 12 numbers on this clock. But describe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in a clockwise circle. And when you come to number 12, or in this case, number 66, where normally where the word, uh, you know, the letter 12 would be on a clock, the number 12 would be on a clock, put down the book of Revelation. And you find that Revelation is uh, closer to Genesis than any other book in the Bible because they dovetail perfectly. Genesis starts everything, Revelation finishes it. And on page 85 and 86, you have an example of this. In Genesis, we read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In Revelation, we read, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis, we have described the first Adam with his wife, Eve, in the Garden of Eden, reigning over the earth. In Revelation, we have described the last Adam, that's Christ, with his wife, the church, uh, in the city of God, reigning over all the universe. This amazing unity. In Genesis, we are told, in the gathering of the waters, call ye the seas. In Revelation, we are told, and there was no more sea. In Genesis, God creates the sun, moon, the day and night. In Revelation, we read, there shall be no night there. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did enlighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Uh, what I would suggest you do if you're using this, uh, either to preach from these notes or to teach from, if you could have copies, just uh, Xerox copies on page 85 and 86 and give out to your class or congregation, and uh, you take, uh, you read the part of Genesis and have the congregation in responsive reading read the part of Revelation, and you just prove to the people as they help you read it that uh, here we have the amazing unity in the Bible. And, of course, this unity is achieved. It wasn't easy to achieve in spite of many things. First of all, in spite of long period of time involved in its writing. Some, uh, well, probably 21 centuries, as we've discussed. If the book of Job was one of the first books to be written, and let's say it was written uh, around 2000 B.C., and then the book of Revelation, 100 A.D., you add those up and you have at least 21 centuries and that's a long time to maintain any kind of unity in anything. And yet here you have an amazing unity involved. And then this unity is, in, is achieved in spite of many authors. 
uh, some 40, and there are various occupations coming from all kinds of occupations, some 19 different occupations. And then this unity is achieved in spite of the different geographical places where the Bible is written and in spite of the many different styles of its writing. Uh, on page 88, I think this is uh, helpful. Let me read it. In closing this section, consider the following illustration to prove now how difficult this unity is. Let us imagine a religious novel of 66 chapters which was begun by a single writer around the 6th century A.D. Okay, so let's just say around 14 centuries ago, uh, somebody decides to write a religious novel. And after the author had completed but five chapters... Now, see in the analogy, this would be the first five books in the Bible, and that was Moses. He suddenly dies. And Moses wrote the first five, and then he dies. But during the next thousand years, up to the 16th century, around 30 amateur freelance writers felt constrained to contribute to this unfinished religious novel. Now, these 30 would be the remaining Old Testament writers, okay? Few of these authors shared anything in common. Some were black, others white, some from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. Uh, they spoke different languages. Let's say some speak Russian, some American, some Chinese. They lived at different times in different countries, had totally different backgrounds and occupations, and wrote in different styles. But see, they just come along now and they add to this religious novel. Now, let us furthermore imagine that at the completion of the 39th chapter, of course, this would be the 39th book in the Old Testament now, wouldn't it? The writing, for some reason, suddenly stops. And from the 16th to the 20th century, no one adds a word to it. And then finally, uh, after this long delay, let's say around uh, 1900, uh, the uh, thing is picked up again by eight new authors, and they add the final 27 chapters. Now, have I got you confused thoroughly? Well, I think you can see, though, what I'm trying to get out here, with all this in mind, this is really a tie-in with what we said before, what would be the chances of this religious novel becoming a moral, a scientific, a prophetic, and a historical unity? Of course, the answer is obvious, not one in a million. In fact, not one in a billion. There's no way there could be any unity here. But that's the story of the Bible, the amazing unity of the Word of God. And then the second supernatural element, of course, is its indestructibility. Its indestructibility in spite of political persecutions. Its indestructibility in spite of religious persecutions. In fact, at times, uh, the church, various churches, various religious organizations have persecuted the Bible far more than the political leaders of the day had. On page 91, just in case you do not read this, I think one of the most interesting things uh, that ever took place concerning the indestructibility of the Word happened in 1529. And uh, perchance you will not read this, or maybe you're driving along in your car listening to this. Uh, I want to read this to you concerning the indestructibility of the Bible now. In 1529, both an amusing and thrilling thing happened in England and Europe concerning the Word of God. William Tyndale... We've talked about him already, of course. Had been driven from England and had fled to Germany, but had continued producing New Testaments and slipping them back into England. One day, the Bishop of London, a man named Bishop Tunstall, remarked to a British merchant, a man named Packington, and a secret friend of Tyndale, of his desire to buy up all copies of the New Testament. In other words, uh, Bishop Tunstall hated the Bible, and he knew that... Uh, that uh, William Tyndale was making a lot of copies, and so he says to Packington, he says, Packington, you get around quite a bit, and you're always flying those 747s or whatever they flew in 1529. And he said, you get to the continent of Europe, and he said, uh, if, you, um, if you ever find out where uh, these this character's producing those, well, listen, uh, I'd like to catch him, but uh, I'll pay you, uh, if nothing else, just get me all the copies you can, and I'll pay him, because I'm going to burn them up. And uh, Packington, of course, he was a friend of Tyndale, and he was probably a Christian. So he said, well, my Lord, if it be your pleasure, I can buy them, for I know where they are sold, if it be your Lord's pleasure to pay for them. But it's going to cost you now, old buddy. He said, but if you can pay, I will then assure you to have every book of them that is imprinted. Said the bishop, 
gentle master Packington, do your diligence and get them, and with all my heart I will pay for them whatsoever they cost you, for the books are erroneous, and I intend to destroy them all and burn them at St. Paul's Cross." Uh, that was a church in England in those days. I suppose the Apostle Paul uh, would have frowned on that, burning uh, the very Word of God that he wrote at a church named after him. Well, Packington then, of course, crossed the English Channel and looked up uh, Tyndale, and he said, William, I know that thou art a poor man, and thou hast a heap of New Testaments and books by thee, by the which thou hast endangered thy friends and beggared thyself. Now, he said, I have now gotten thee a merchant, with which with ready money shall dispatch thee of all thou hast, if you think it so profitable to thyself. Who is the merchant? asked Tyndale. The Bishop of London, answered Packington. Oh, said Tyndale, I can't do that. He'll burn them. Yes, but what of that? said Packington. The Bishop will burn them anyhow. He'll find them and burn them. And it is best that you should have money for enabling you to imprint others instead. I shall do this, said Tyndale, for these two benefits shall come thereof. First, I shall get money to bring myself out of debt, and the whole world will cry out against the burning of God's word. And second, the overplus of money shall remain to me, shall make me more studious to correct the said New Testament, and so newly to imprint the same ones again. And I trust the second will be much better than ever was the first. So the bargain was made. The bishop had the books. Packington had the thanks, Tyndale had the money, and God had the glory. Do you think God has a sense of humor? For every one of these books, let's say they cost, uh, well, probably in common terminology, let's say they cost maybe $5 a piece to make. They were rather expensive. All right, so uh, Packington was charging maybe $20 a piece to the Bishop uh, of London, Bishop Tunstall. So for every one that he was buying and burning, he was really funding money to uh, make uh, three more or four more. So it was a four to one thing or whatever. Um, later, uh, a man was being tried as a heretic about that time, and the judge promised him uh, favor if he would tell how Tyndale received so much help in printing so many New Testaments. And he replied, he said, More, My Lord, I will tell you truly, it is the Bishop of London that has helped us, for he hath bestowed upon us a great deal of money upon the New Testament to burn them, and that hath been and yet is our chief help and comfort. Uh, I would like to have found out uh, what happened when the judge probably uh, cornered Bishop Tunstall and said, Well, I found out today why you are having so much problems uh, with these New Testaments. Actually, sir, you have been helping out your enemy. God does indeed have a sense of humor. All right, we'll stop. I think we have about another minute left here, but we'll stop at this point and continue during tape number 11.